Thank you, Lord, that your love changes everything. Thank you, Lord, for this day, this opportunity to worship you once again in spirit and in truth, and to walk alongside each other, sharing our lives together in your name. Thank you for your grace and your mercy, your provision and your protection. Speak to us now a word of challenge and conviction, a word of liberation and freedom, a word of hope, power, promise, transformation, and joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> My sermon for this Labor Day weekend, this 15th Sunday of Pentecost, comes from the assigned gospel reading for today, which is a scattering of verses, actually. It comes from Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, and then skips to 14 and 15, and then skips again to 21 through 23. My sermon title for today is The Heart of the Matter. The Heart of the Matter. There is a brewing controversy in Jesus' life and ministry with those who would shortly become his only real enemies, namely the religious leaders and authorities of his day. The controversy surrounds understandings and interpretations of God's law as found in Scripture, specifically what we Christians now call the Old Testament. Jesus, you may recall, seemed to play footloose and fancy free with the laws of God, as handed down from God to Moses and the people of Israel generations before. Jesus certainly had his own take on things. Oftentimes, he seemed to heighten the law to absurd, preposterous levels, and at other times, he seemed to discard it or ignore it entirely. Most often, however, it was a matter of emphasis, priority, and interpretation. Jesus caused contention, you may remember, by healing or curing people on the Sabbath day. An act of love in itself, but one which violated God's prohibition of work on that one day of the week, as understood by most of his own people, the Jews. Jesus further invited opposition by accepting, receiving, and dining with sinners, tax collectors, and prostitutes, ones whom the law deemed unclean and outcast by their dubious behavior. Here today, the issue begins with ritual purity, that is the washing and cleansing of hands and vessels, before progressing towards food itself, which occurs in the left out verses 17 through 19. And the issue, my friends, is which things are deemed clean and allowed versus unclean and prohibited, most of which can be found back in the book of Leviticus. Jesus, at first blush, appears to be lax about these particular rules and rituals as he dispenses with the ceremonial washing of hands and vessels along with the dietary prohibitions of the Torah, the law of Moses. So to be fair to the Pharisees and scribes here, they are not simply making this stuff up from scratch, out of thin air or out of left field. No, rather they could cite you chapter and verse, as it were, from Leviticus and parts of Deuteronomy to back their claims. Here again, it undoubtedly comes down to a matter of emphasis, what legal scholars might term original intent, and what many of us commonly understand as the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. You can tell from the text itself that the Pharisees, scribes, and peoples particular understanding and interpretations of these laws has stood the test of time and actually dates back generations as verses 3 and 5 refer to them as the tradition of the elders. You could just as easily detect Jesus' frustration and impatience with what he considers their deviation from the original intent of that law when he says in verse number 8, you abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. In verse 9, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. And in verse number 13, which we did not read today, thus making void the word of God through your tradition which you have handed on. 
Herein Jesus is contrasting the word or the commandment of God, which he calls, which he holds paramount with human tradition, which at least here he seems to denigrate. Begs the question then, what human traditions do we hold steadfast and reverently, which at best obscure the word of God or at worst contradict it? That's a biting indictment, isn't it? I don't know about you, my friends, but that always arrests me. The contemporary English version translates here. Ooh, not good, I'm sorry. Jesus initially charges them with hypocrisy. As he quotes from the prophet Isaiah in chapter 29, verse 13, in case you're interested. This people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me teaching human precepts as doctrines. That's fighting indictment. I don't know about you, my friends, but that always arrests me. The contemporary English version translates here, All of you praise me with your words, but you never really think about me. While the message remix version reads here, These people make a big show of saying the right thing. But their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover. I doubt anyone among us today is so holy and pious as to have these words not prick our conscience. Jesus more specifically advocates his case in verses 14 and 15 by laying out the general principle he is applying. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. The disciples in Mark are often portrayed as obtuse, thick-headed, never quite getting it, which I submit is good news for us. And so Jesus further explains his rationale in the remaining verses of 17 through 23, part of which is omitted from our reading today. Do you not see, he says, that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart, but rather the stomach, and so goes out the bowels? Thus he declared all foods clean. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, that is, financial or monetary greed, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, that is, sexually lewd or lustful behavior, envy, slander, pride, and folly, that is, foolishness. All these evil things come from within. They defile a person. If all of us are honest with ourselves, I think much of this list hits far closer home than perhaps we like to admit. The rather obvious move Jesus is making here is very appealing and commonsensical, yet at the same time it is unnerving and frightening. He is essentially moving from outer to inner, from actions and rituals to thoughts and intentions, from what can be seen and detected to what is less obvious. Contrary to our human proclivity to put the cart before the horse, Jesus is trying to reinstate the primacy of the horse. I purchased a plaque many years ago which hangs in my home office and reads simply, Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become character. Character is everything. Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Actions become character. And character is everything. Jesus seems to be saying something similar here and in many other places in Scripture that character is everything and that your character is based on your actions but it doesn't stop there. Your actions are based on your words, and your words are based on your thoughts. 
To me, that is both appealing and logical, and yet also unnerving and frightening. For I think most of us would agree that it's perhaps easier to regulate and tame our actions, less so our words, and even less so our thoughts. Who can effectively regulate, train, and dis discipline his or her own thoughts as Jesus seems to be requesting, if not demanding, in this text. The Apostle Paul gives some practical advice on this front towards the very end of his epistle or letter to the Philippians when he concludes, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about those things. I expect all of us would agree with that sentiment and would do our best to accommodate it, but it's still much easier said than done, easier to attempt than to actually accomplish. The problem and the solution are really one and the same thing in this text. There is one concept which is paramount in this text and upon which, therefore, everything else hangs. Verse 6, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Verse number 19, which again was left out, whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile since it enters not the heart, but rather the stomach and so passes on. Verse 21, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. The heart, my friends, is a funny thing. It is both the problem and the solution. The source of much evil and the seat of much love, affection, and compassion. But who can control it? Who can regulate it? Who can direct their hearts in the right way? Think about the occurrences of heart in Scripture, my friends. Do you know what the very first instance is? Genesis 6, just prior to the flood. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind in the earth and it grieved him to his heart. Do you remember why Pharaoh refused to let the Hebrew slaves go free in Egypt back in the book of Exodus? What was hardened? It was hard. God refuses to anoint any of the tall and handsome sons of Jesse, king over Israel, until the ruddy-complexioned boy David comes in. Reason given, because humankind looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. King David is later exalted as a man after God's own heart. The psalmist once cried out in lament and repentance, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit. Within me. In the Beatitudes, Jesus blessed those who are pure in, saying, They shall behold God. God promises his people in Ezekiel 36, A new heart I will give you. I will take out of you that heart of stone, and I will put in you a heart of flesh. You shall be my people, and I shall be your God. And perhaps my favorite, because it is an obscure, unknown verse, and yet so powerful. 1 John 3, verse 20, we reassure our hearts before God, because whenever our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. We reassure our hearts before God, because whenever our hearts condemn us, and they can, we know that God is greater than our hearts. So our hearts are not ultimate. They're rather penultimate. God's character of grace and mercy and forgiveness, that is what is ultimate. So apply that plaque, not to you, but to God. Thoughts become words. Words become actions. Acts become character. Character is everything. God's character is based on His actions which are based on his words, which are based on his thoughts, 
and God's thoughts toward you are loving. They are merciful. They are accepting. They are embracing. And that makes all the difference in the world. That is the source of your heart's transformation. My friends, as God extends grace and mercy to you, God forgives you all your sins because of His Son, Jesus Christ. And as God's grace and mercy and forgiveness surround you and envelop you, you will find your character being transformed. It will be transformed because your actions are being transformed, your words are being transformed, and your thoughts are being transformed. The thoughts of your heart are no longer only of evil continually, as Genesis said. Your heart is being softened. Your thoughts are becoming more charitable. Your words kinder and gentler. Your actions more compassionate and just. And your character holier and possessing of integrity. Even if your heart has been hardened and it convicts you, always remember that God is greater than your heart. God knows all things. God loves you unconditionally and eternally. God forgives you all your sins. God transforms your life. And God is performing you into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ, even as we speak at this very moment. Your heart is increasingly becoming a heart of love. A heart of love for God and a heart of love for your neighbor. That's why you don't have to be concerned with Mark chapter 7 anymore. You need not worry about hand washing and vessel washing or dietary restrictions, except perhaps for reasons of physical health and hygiene, but not for holiness. For according to Romans 13, love is the fulfilling of the law. All the commandments of God can be summed up in this one sentence. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So go forth knowing that Jesus has given you a new heart this day, a new mind with new thoughts and a new capability and capacity for love. As Paul once told the Corinthians, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, nor the human heart conceived what God has in store for those who love him what he has in store for those who love him. You can't even imagine what the consequences of your new heart are about to be. The heart of the matter. Amen.